I really see this as um, recognition of the faculty of this college as a whole. Um, I am very familiar with a large number of the faculty, and uh, we all work very hard to, to be effective at teaching. And the fact that I was um, uh, recognized in particular, I don't think is as significant as the school itself um, um, being recognized for our, our emphasis on, on good teaching and being effective at teaching. Basically, I'm very good at, at stealing things that are effective, mm -hmm. at recognizing a technique um, for getting through to students and adopting it and, and tweaking and working with it and so forth. Um, the main thing that I brought here was a revision of the entire introductory physics curriculum using a method called peer instruction that was developed at Harvard by um, a fellow named Eric Mazur. And the basic idea is, is that you must require the students to engage the student, sorry, to engage the material during class. So rather than the classic way physics seems, seems to be taught, which is professor puts equations on board, students write down equations, students go back to dorm and look at them and say, what in the world does that mean for many hours? And of course, every student is convinced that every other student understood things. Um, the fact is that that's the least effective way of getting material from the professor's notes to the student's notes without really passing through the brain of either. Um, so the first thing we do is all the classic um, things that you would do in, a, in an ordinary lecture. Uh, the definitions, the der derivations, just um, kind of the boilerplate material. The students see all that the night before. Um, my notes that I used to teach from when I taught a conventional class are posted online and the students are required to read them the night before. Now even with the best intentions, I know that I wouldn't always do my assigned reading in advance unless I had something to make me do it. And in this case, there's a warm-up assignment before every class. So the students actually have to send in an electronic form that wherein they try to address a practical application of what we're talking about. So I'll just set up a simple example. Why is it um, easier to balance a broom when its point is on your hand and the, the straw is up? That's fairly easy to do, and all the students can walk down the hall and find a broom and do it. Why is it easier than balancing it the other way with the straw in your hand? And it's not because the straw is, is flimsy or anything. Um, but they have that question after um, reading the material about something called moment of inertia, which is a rather technical subject. So they are forced to try and make that connection between the abstract thing they've been reading about and the practical world that they are dealing with. Um, now, they send me in their answer to the question, and I'm not looking for the correct answer. What I'm looking for is what they are thinking, because that's the most important thing I can get from my students is not what you think the answer is, but why do you think that is the answer? Because that's something I can work with. Even if you have the right answer, you may not be thinking about it for the right reason. Um, so before class, I get the feedback from all my students, so I get something like 50 um, short essays explaining why they think ha that happens. I get up in the morning, I read it before class, and I restructure the class based on their responses. So I, I know if everyone is just not quite getting this aspect or if everybody got that aspect, but there's something else. Um, so I walk into class and I know what I'm facing. I don't just assume they got everything I, I did, we did in last class. I know pretty much where they are. During the course of the class, then um, I don't have to present any of the boilerplate stuff, the uh, standard definitions and derivations. Um, instead, I will present them with situations in which they have to apply um, those ideas again. And we use clickers such, such as this. Um, we've had these for about 10 years now. And um, a lot of schools use them, but it's very important not simply to use them, but to incorporate the way you teach to use them most effectively. So what is it's an electronic response system. Okay. So I will ask, basically after starting the class, briefly just 
kind of going over the extent of the topics, uh, asking if there are any big questions that people know that they have at that moment. Um, I'll put up a fairly simple to read and understand multiple choice question. But these questions are actually designed to target the students' misconceptions because I've just read all their feedback. I know what their misconceptions are. Mm -hmm. I have questions that are targeted at that. Mm -hmm. So I put up the question, the students answer it, and um, they have one minute to think about it on their own. They must privately come up with an answer and vote. And that's what the, what, what the clickers are for. That's where they get their choice. After that minute, on the computer screen, where the students can see it, up comes a histogram showing how many students chose answer A, B, C, and so mm -hmm. forth. Typically, on the first polling like this, the answers will be all across mm -hmm. the board. And um, then the real important part comes. Because each student has to turn and try to convince their neighbors that they know what's going on. They have to describe their line of logic and convince their neighbor. So during this period, I will wander around the room, listen to conversations. If it's a good argument going on, I keep going. If I get to a group in which everyone has, they're complacent. Oh, we all have C. Well, why? Uh, we don't know. We just agree. That's no good. They have to act, explain why to each other. And you'll find sometimes that they'll have different reasons for the same answer, and they're both wrong. Um, so I will prod them to keep working toward finding a line of robust logic that will help them really ex understand the abstract knowledge in the context of the problem. So that'll go on for something like 10, 15 minutes. I wander around, listen, and when I feel that enough has gone on, I will re-poll, and it'll go typically from 5% right to 95% right. And it's remarkable, and it is so rewarding as well to be able to see that these students who, you know, 10 minutes before were all over the map, they just really didn't understand it. And by the time they get through, they do understand it, they have a deeper understanding. <clears throat> they have insight, they build intuition by doing this. Um, and the students really get into it, they really enjoy it. Uh, I, at the course, used to be at 8 o'clock in the morning, and professors would come by and they'd see me and they'd like ask me later, like, how are you keeping them so involved? It's 8 o'clock in the morning. They were arguing. They were passionately arguing. Said, That's exactly right. And a lot of times they will come up with their own questions to, uh, what happens if you move that light bulb over to there and attach it to that? What will happen there? I said, that is a darn good question. And I'll grab a spare overhead, write it out, slap it down, and... Uh, I swear I've seen them almost get into fist fights. I've seen uh, mm -hmm. money being laid mm -hmm. on the outcome of demonstrations, and it is very effective. We have um, independent diagnostic uh, tools that we use to test their outcomes, and um, they do genu genuinely learn. Okay. Yeah, we have there's the standard um, diagnostic tests that you give the students at the beginning of class mm -hmm. and the beginning of the course yeah. and at the end of the course. And you can, so you can see overall of what they did not know, how much have they improved. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, our students do tremendously better than your standard classical traditional physics class. Yeah, so it's pretty we, interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, on the MCAT um, section on physical science, um, students taking traditional courses typically do slightly more poorly mm -hmm. on that section as compared to the biology section. Mm -hmm. And our students are on a par or even slightly better. So there's a definitely an improvement on the MCAT as well as um, on this diagnostic test. I also have tons of reports back anecdotal from students who f finish my course and take the MCAT and basically say, I didn't need to study again for physics because I knew it. Mm -hmm. um, I signed up for one of those courses that you, you um, take to train for the MCAT. The review courses. The review courses. And I was having to correct the guy, the person who was tutoring them, right? And then after the MCAT, it's like, it, it was the easiest part. I hear that wow. fairly often. I get emails from students who are now in med school 
saying, first of all, hey, you know that stuff we had learned in physics? Yes, you do use it in med school. <laughs> it is relevant. And uh, second of all, they really knew it. And the students who had been at o other schools um, were asking them, well, how did you actually learn this? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, dude, I, I, I took a course in it. Mm -hmm. Didn't you? When the Challenger spacecraft blew up, that derailed my career for quite a ways because uh -huh. I work on Jupiter. Uh -huh. It's a long commute, but um, <laughs> all the postdocs for that kind of research dried up. And so for many years, I was kind of struggling for an appropriate position. I worked for eight years as a pure researcher. Mm -hmm. And that, I was successful. I was supporting myself with, with research grants. Um, I have a, um, uh, a publication record I'm very proud of, mm -hmm. and I, um, but I began finding myself increasingly dissatisfied with having conversations that only like eight people in the world could understand at a mm -hmm. given time. You know, it's just a very tiny little niche in which that kind of investigation was going on, and I wasn't sharing with young people and helping them learn and appreciate the things that were really neat that I was able to discover. Mm -hmm. So I, I started moonlighting teaching until I built up a um, sufficiently impressive resume that I could uh, be um, attractive for uh, colleges like Birmingham Southern. It's the peer, the peer instruction of Eric Mazuras, but there's also a lot of other little aspects. As I say, mm -hmm. I steal wherever I can. <laughs> So, um, uh, another example, the lecture demonstrations, that's the, are the heart of any physics class. Mm -hmm. That's what the students remember, it's like all these really cool demonstrations. And the one in particular that I, that I do involves a disc and a hoop, of the same mass and radius rolling down an inclined plane. And the question is, which one hits, reaches the bottom first? Now, this is done in every physics class. The way I do it is to set it up as a question. If we do this, which one will be, will reach the bottom first? Um, the students spend 20 minutes arguing about it before we actually do the demonstration. And they are engaged, they are committed, they are excited when I finally let those things roll down the plane. I've asked pretty much last few years, every student I've, person I've run into who had physics at some other place said, by the way, do you remember this demo? Oh yeah, I remember that, it was really cool. What happened? Which one got to the bottom first? Oh, I don't remember, uh, but it was really cool, I remember at the time. Do um, you remember what it was supposed to show you? No, I don't exactly, but it was really cool at the time. Mm -hmm. I do the same thing with my students who took it years ago. I asked them, I said, oh, well obviously the one that's the hoop has the bigger moment of inertia, it's more resistant to changing its angular uh, state, therefore it's going to roll more slowly. So they do mm -hmm. really learn it differently. That's cool. Yes. And much more rewarding, mm -hmm. much more fun too. So when you're in a class and you are actively getting this kind of feedback from them, uh, first of all you have to really establish an environment in which it is safe for them to screw up. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask them, okay, explain your rationale for your answer, and they say something, typically there will be one key element of it that is mistaken. So you can have one bad bit of logic, the, the rest of it follows consistently. So what you have to do is pick out of their explanation, ah, you know, this all follows from that and everything and does well, but over here this thing, but would that not apply and you put up a counterfactual thing. And they go, oh right, so that can't quite be right. So what you've done is given them the confidence with all mm -hmm. the additional uh, logic that they had, um, but you're nudging them to the point where they can see, oh wait a minute, I can realize what that missing step is, it's, ah, that's it. And then they run out to the rest of the answer. When I, when I first introduced this method, I had a lot of resistance from a lot of students mm -hmm. who just wanted the old way. Right. They wanted to be told the answer. Um, and the, the problem with that is when you are told the right answer, 
you're, you're not really learning. All you're doing is memorizing. You just mm -hmm. and but it's very hard because one of the things about the, the class is that it it quite often puts you in a state of um, cognitive dissonance, in that you think this is right, but the professor has told you this thing, and that implies that that's not right. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there with those two ideas, and your brain is going, "How can this be? You know, why is this thus? Mm -hmm. What is the reason for this thusness?" And it's that's very troubling, mm -hmm. and so they have to work through it to reconcile it, and then there is there's a maturation going on of their thinking process. So um, I had a lot of resistance, mm -hmm. and I don't think I changed my methods much in the first few years, but I ch I found additional motivation for the students in providing them with the kind of, of um, testimonials um, and hard data, you know, the MCAT scores and the other diagnostic test scores, mm -hmm. told the students could really be convinced that it worked. But the most important thing was the word got through the grapevine. You take this class, you suffer through it, you put in all that it takes, and you will learn physics, mm -hmm. right? And quite frankly, it is hard. It's hard on, on all of them, and it's tough on me. The semesters that I teach it, it's just exhausting because mm -hmm. there's so many facets to it. But it is, it is so much more fun than walking in with a piece of chalk and just saying, here's the way the world works. Got that? Okay. We encourage research mm -hmm. by the faculty as a means to involve students in research, to let them see what, what it's all about. Um, one of my uh, summer students last year, Dan Bergen, is taking an honors class this semester in uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. And they're discussing it from all sorts of various angles. And he told me he was very excited because he could identify it with, oh yes, that's what I did last summer. Mm -hmm. and the, the real thing about basic research is when you're really doing basic research, you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You are floundering about, you're trying to find a solution, you're grasping at straws at times, and, and slowly making progress. And, and he was able to really have a feel for that. He said he previously had this impression that scientists were like these madmen who, mm -hmm. you know, were in laboratories with beakers and mm -hmm. so forth. When an awful lot of physics gets done, sitting over a pad of paper, staring out into space, going, well, what if we try this? What happens? And you look at it, and you talk about it, and the other person says, I don't understand that. Well, let me, let me try and make that idea more rigorous. Let me try and clean it up. Um, and so I find that just immensely valuable. The most important thing that, that to me is at every stage getting feedback from the students about what they're thinking and how they're thinking. So in my upper level classes, I don't use clickers. It's a smaller setup, say 10 students. Mm -hmm. And there I work with whiteboards. Mm -hmm. And so often I've just asked them, well, look, I think what I've just said is very simple. Why don't you try this example? And they'll d just get stuck right at the start. Mm -hmm. And it's things that, because I've been doing this 30 years, I just totally take for granted. And to them, it's like, well, how do you know that you're allowed to do that? How would you ever think of doing that? Mm -hmm. And the answer, of course, is experience. Right. And being able to get that feedback from them immediately on the spot means that I'm not going to waste 20 or 30 minutes by just running past anything that they have any comprehension of.